I think the thing that to me is the number one issue uh, facing the Man Street investors is inflation. And it's pretty clear to me that inflation is not transitory. It's here to stay. And it's probably the single biggest threat to certainly financial markets. And, and again, probably, I think, to society just in general. So, so Paul Tudor Jones, one of the most successful U.S. fund managers known for his bets for interest rates and currencies, basically just came out to say that inflation is not transitory and essentially going to be worse than we think. Whether it is actually going to be worse than we think, only time will tell. The concern right now is that inflation is supposed to be transitory, but the September CPI numbers are saying otherwise. Okay, cool story, bro. You basically just mentioned a bunch of buzzwords, mentioned a famous person. How does that really impact my stocks? That's exactly what I'm going to dig into in this video. We'll get a better understanding of how inflation might impact retail investors like us and my plan to make the most of this situation if it does get worse. And then towards the end of this video, I'll answer some questions from my previous video and a portfolio update at the end. As usual, if you do learn something new, it will mean the world to me if you could gently smash the like button somewhere around here. And if you really enjoy what I'm doing, consider supporting my channel via Patreon where I do some extra content and also I'm a little bit more available in my Discord server. And of course, no, this video is not financial advice or recommendation to do anything. So without further ado, let's go. So I've broken this video into three main parts. First, we're going to understand inflation a little bit more. And then secondly, how does inflation actually impact retail investors like me and you? And then most importantly, which is the third part, what exactly is my plan to make the most of the situation if inflation were to get worse? There are many different ways to understand inflation. But I think this graph that you see in front of you is by far the easiest way to understand and explain the concept of inflation. I'm going to borrow a few memes to make this a little bit more fun. And we're going to start with the concept of CPI inflation. CPI inflation is probably the most commonly quoted and talked about item in mainstream media. It's the whole concept that in the 70s, it could cost 25 cents for a cup of coffee. And then 2019, the same cup of coffee now costs around $1.60. Now, the coffee probably hasn't changed, but it's the amount of money that's chasing after the same cup of coffee that have changed. And this is the whole idea that inflation erodes away your purchasing power. Now, what's really important to understand is that CPI inflation is a symptom of more money in the system. And where does all of that money come from? All of that money comes from monetary expansion or monetary inflation. And that's where the central banks prints money and therefore there is more money circulating in the system. Now, if there are more money circulating in the system. The exact same situation with consumer goods and services can also happen to assets. So this is where your stocks, your crypto, your real estate assets also appreciate in value. If there are more dollars chasing after those assets, then of course, the price of those assets will also appreciate. And this is the generalized concept of inflation. Of course, I am simplifying it here. It's more nuanced in real life. But if you want a more detailed explanation, then check out this video on the coming inflation crisis where I do a much more detailed explanation on inflation as a whole. A bit of inflation is actually good for the economy because higher prices will lead to higher profits and higher profits will lead to company investing in their employees. So therefore more jobs and more jobs means more spending. And therefore that is a virtuous cycle. But when you have inflation out of control, especially if your wages are growing slower than CPI inflation, then that means that our purchasing power is decreasing over time. And if our ability to buy the same amount of stuff is decreasing over time, then that will lead to lower consumption, which means lower profits, which means not as many jobs. So you can see that a bit of inflation is definitely not a bad thing at all. It's when inflation gets way out of control, that's when there will be a negative impact for the economy. Okay, so now that we have leveled up our understanding on inflation, how does that impact retail investors like me and you? So for the Aussie CPI, it's currently sitting at around 3.8% and the target is around 2%. So you can make the observation that they would have hit their inflation target. Now, at the same time for the US, it's also 
target at 2%, but I guess more persistently at 2%. And you can also make the observation that they have well surpassed their target of persistently being above 2%. What you need to know when it comes to inflation's impact on the stock market is that according to Schroeder's, where they looked at the US market from March 1973 to December 2020, that there is a weak relationship between US CPI inflation when it's lower than 4% and US P ratio. That's why the dots are all over the place and not very close to the green line. As US inflation goes above 5, 6, 7, 8%, there is a stronger relationship. And that's why the dots are much closer to this statistical model right here. So at a given level of 5.5%, we should be expecting the P ratio to be much closer to 20 or 15. And right now, the P ratio for S&P 500 is around 28. If the inflation is supposed to be at 5.5%, which is somewhere over here, we should be expecting a USP ratio between around 15 to a little bit above 15, so 18 to 15-ish. At this point, I think it's fairly reasonable to expect some kind of multiple contraction if this model were to stand true. This is the thing. We don't actually know how inflation will pan out from here. It could get way worse or it could be actually transitory. But there is a recent method that I learned from my Discord server on how to get a higher quality hint on whether inflation is here to stay or is it actually going to improve from here. And that method is actually going through the earnings call between major retailers like Woolies or even Costco in the US because the higher input cost is going to impact them first. And a lot of analysts will want to know whether that is here to stay or that is actually going to impact them on a longer term basis. So I have left a link in the description box below for the latest earnings call with Woolies. And they actually talked about that for specific categories of their products like avocados. Because there is an oversupply, the price is actually coming back down. However, for long life side, they actually talked about that international freight rates have gone up in the order of between 25 to 30%, depending on the port and the time frame you're looking at. And it doesn't seem like the international freight rates are coming down anytime soon. Now, some of this cost is offset by exchange rate movements, but not all of it. So from that perspective, it definitely seems like inflation is more persistent than we think. Given that is the case, it doesn't sound too bad to at least have a plan if inflation gets way out of hand in the future. So here's my plan. When we take a trip down memory lane for the US equity sector performance in high and rising inflation environments between 1973 and 2020, you can see that energy, equity, REITs, consumer staples, industrials, financials, utility, healthcare, tends to have a high probability of beating inflation. But this quadrant of industries tends to have a high level of outperformance against inflation. But this is the thing we need to remember. Just because an industries have outperformed inflation in the past does not mean that it's going to continue to outperform inflation in the future. So if you were to stock pick in these industries, then please make sure you do your own research to try and understand whether the industry prospects have changed. Because it's very likely that the energy sector, their industry prospects have changed quite a bit. For me personally, because I'm working full time again, I don't have as much time to focus on my portfolio. So in order to make my life easier, to make the most of the situation that if inflation were to go out of hand, I'm breaking my plan down into three main parts. I have the stock picking part, the ETF part, and also growing my ability to generate income. Now, I wanna talk about part two first, which is the ETF portion. The ETF portion is pretty straightforward. And this is me dollar cost averaging into high quality ETFs that I currently have. And the good thing is that the majority of these ETFs are in Australian companies. And the good thing about Australian companies is that we are incredibly fortunate that some of our blue chips are in industrials, financials, utility, healthcare. So I don't really have to go out of my way to pick inflation hedge companies, mostly because Australian ETFs are mostly, I would think they belong to the inflation hedge category of companies. 
I will continue to keep my US ETFs relatively small because I'm already stock picking mostly in the US um, stock market. So I don't want too much exposure to the US stock market. I'll do a portfolio update in just a second so you can see what's inside my portfolio. But for the stock picking part, I'm still very interested in learning about high quality companies that might outperform the market in the future. So that's Zillow, Shopify, Tesla, Peloton. So I'm still very, very much interested in stock picking, but maybe not as much because now I have less time. And also I don't wanna individually pick inflation hedge companies. And the third part of my plan is to grow my ability to generate income. If inflation were to go out of hand, I wanna make sure that my purchasing power gets better or stronger over time so that I have more liquidity to invest. Because if you really think about it, if inflation were to get worse and if it does get really bad and the market tanks, I wanna make sure that I have the liquidity to invest. And this is one of the main reasons why I am focusing on my ability to generate income right now. And this is why I've also decided to go back to work full time. I have documented my entire process on how I'm able to generate more income in this video on three simple steps to more income. I'll leave a link in the description box below if you do wanna check out that video yourself. Before I do a portfolio update, I wanna answer a few of the questions that you had from our previous video. So if you do have any questions you wanna answer, you want me to answer in my next video, just let me know in the comment section below or like the question so that it goes all the way to the top and I can see it. So the first question is from a Campbell where he asked, is it really worth dollar cost averaging into an index ETF? For me, I have my super setup, so it's basically dollar cost averaging into an ETF or index fund. When you get more return on investment by saving a cash pile and investing a thoroughly researched undervalued stock. Well, firstly, thank you for the question. And for those who don't know, can't actually touch your super until a retirement age, like 65. For me personally, my journey is about getting to financial independence early. I don't wanna wait till 65 to touch that super. So for me, I've never considered super. Maybe in the future when I reach my fire number and it's more tax efficient for me to invest in my super fund, then sure, I will consider that. But for now, dollar cost averaging into ETF is my own choice. So Galileo asks, do I invest in crypto? Yes, I do. Mostly in Bitcoin and Ethereum, just starting to get into altcoins at the moment. Not really interested in speculating all that much, but if you guys do want more crypto content, just let me know in the comment section below. And then Alex asks, great video and keep up with the forward momentum in your day job and YouTube channel. Shout out to you, Alex. I appreciate you. You mentioned you also have a mortgage and property with the property market performing well. Are you considering accessing equity in your property to further your investing goals? Not right now, mostly because I'm focusing on my ability to generate income and I think I'm doing really well on that front. So I want to leave that for a future opportunity. And plus, I'm sharing the, the mortgage and the property with my partner. So it's not just my decision, it's also our decision. So right now, no, not really thinking about that. But maybe in the future, um, if an opportunity does come up. Now, the next question is pretty big. And Tharusha is essentially asking, what exactly is the relationship between an ETF provider and the ETF products? And also, what exactly is the long-term impact of an ETF flooded market? Now, personally speaking, I am not an expert in ETFs, so I can only speak from a retail investor perspective. And if I understood your question correctly, with an ETF provider, the way I understand how things work is that they own the underlying shares or assets. And that ETF is publicly traded, which allows people like me and you to buy and sell on the stock exchange. Now, the general concern around ETF is that because it tracks some kind of index like ASX 300 or gaming or cybersecurity, not all of the companies inside the ETF is of a quality that you deem as high. So what I'm trying to say is that it's quite easy to also include crappier companies inside the ETF because it's part of a theme or diversification. That makes price discovery a little bit more challenging because when institutions pump money into an ETF, you're inherently gonna bring up both the good and the bad companies all at the same time. So as retail investors, 
we might not be getting an accurate reflection on the quality of the company because that company is being included in the ETF. Now, if you want to read more about it, Michael Burry actually talked quite extensively about that. And I will leave a Bloomberg article also in the description box below. And I think that will answer your question much more in detail. So just a quick portfolio update for my CMC market portfolio side of things is worth 128,000 Australian dollars. 8,000 of that is in cash. So I'll be allocating that money over the next couple of weeks. And the only change I did make on this side is that I've added more into my Zillow position. And right now it's sitting at around 2% of my portfolio. So still not very big, but I think the main thesis behind that is that the millennials are getting into the ripe age to purchase homes in the future. And I really think that Zillow have an incredible SEO advantage in terms of generating traffic through their site. And now they're working on monetizing that traffic by getting into iBuying, mortgages, etc. A lot of negative sentiment towards Zillow at the moment, but I think the management team is incredibly high quality. The vision is great. So that was something that I added a little bit more into my portfolio. Now with my stake portfolio is currently sitting at around 48,000 US dollars with around 3000 in cash, which I will allocate over the next couple of weeks as well. Honestly, not too many changes on this side as well. I know that Tesla with their earnings call have been going through a rally. And I think that most Tesla shareholders are super happy about that at the moment. But I am focusing on building out my portfolio a little bit more. Right now, the opportunity I am very, very interested in is Shopify, Twilio, and also Regeneron and Bristol Myers as well. I'm trying to build out those positions a little bit more where I can. And if there are more opportunities for me to build out new positions, I'll let you know as well. As usual, I'm not sponsored by Stake, but if you do want to try Stake for yourself, I have left a link in the description box below. If you survived all the way to the end, thank you. You are the real MVP. And if you did learn something new, it would mean the world to me if you could gently smash a like button somewhere around there, subscribe to my channel so that when I release future content, you'll be the first one to know. As always, Oro will always do the honors and I'm going to see you very, very soon.